muy buenos días y bienvenidos a este acto de inauguración del decimoquinto simposio de la Asociación Internacional de Mujeres Filósofas. So welcome uh, to this um, um, opening event of the 15th um, conference of the uh, Association of Women Philosophers. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this university. Esta es una universidad eh, muy antigua, fundada a finales del siglo XIII. So this was founded at the end of the 13th century, in fact, and that was the time of a lot of debates, as you know very well, in philosophy. Y luego fue realmente refundada a finales del siglo XV. Este fue en el año 1499. Y de esa época, sobre todo del siglo XVI, eh, es eh, la presencia que tienen en esta sala de nombres de algunos de los al alumnos que participaron en la vida de la universidad durante los siglos XVI y XVII, fundamentalmente. Eh, este fue un lugar eh, de un debate filosófico muy intenso a lo largo del siglo XVI y XVII, eh, muy vinculado, evidentemente, a la teología en, a en aquel momento. Muchos de los alumnos y profesores que participaban del claustro de esta universidad formaron parte también de debates ideológicos y religiosos que te, tuvieron mucho que ver con el concilio de Trento, con el erasmismo, con el movimiento de la contrarreforma y, asimismo, con el movimiento de los derechos de los indígenas en América. Este es, por tanto, un lugar, a mi juicio, ideal para acoger los debates en estos próximos días, el, hoy martes, miércoles, jueves y viernes, sobre el papel de las mujeres y la filosofía. Eh, podríamos decir que como pequeñísima compensación a esa presencia uh, fundamentalmente masculina a lo largo de los siglos XVI y XVII en el debate filosófico en esta universidad, en el siglo XVIII esta fue la primera universidad que doctoró a una mujer, a María Isidra de Guzmán. As, I'll try to summarize that in English for those who haven't been able to follow my, my words in Spanish. I was simply saying that this was the place for philosophical uh, debates, particularly concerned with theology. Uh, many of the students and professors at this university during the 16th and 17th centuries uh, participated very actively in the Council of Trent, for instance, in the Counter-Reformation in, in Spain, but also in the Erasmian thought, uh, which was uh, one of the most progressive um, philosophical and ideological movements in Europe, and particularly in Spain at the time. Um, and um, as well in the thought uh, related to the uh, role played by the indigenous populations in Latin America, in America. So some of the uh, names that you can see on the walls of, of this paraninfo, of this um, um, assembly hall, uh, were uh, part of, of that debate. So a small compensation for so many male uh, philosophers uh, and thinkers, um, I was saying in Spanish that this was also the first university in the country which gave a, a PhD degree to a woman. Uh, that happened at the end of the 18th century and her name was Maria Isidra de Guzmán. So, um, that's why I'm really happy and I want to thank you for coming to Alcalá to hold uh, this 15th conference of the International Association of Women Philosophers. Um, it's our privilege that you have um, chosen Alcalá uh, for this uh, conference. And I do hope that you will have a very fruitful exchange of ideas during these uh, three, four days, four days, in fact, in Alcalá. Uh, and that you can also enjoy, of course, the town, uh, which is a historic town, um, as this is a historic university. So thank you for coming. Muchas gracias por asistir a, a este acto y a este congreso. Y voy a dar la palabra a continuación a la profesora doctora Do Doña Tuya uh, Pulkinen, que es catedrática de estudios de género en la Universidad de Helsinki. So, Tuja, I'm going to give you now the floor. Uh, Tuja Pulkinen, as I have just said, is professor of gender studies at the University of Helsinki. Uh, 
So the floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you very much. I have a pleasure of welcoming everybody on behalf of the board of the International Association of Women uh, Philosophers, IAPH, uh, and to tell something about this organization which is behind the, this conference. Uh, so International Association of Women Philosophers was found already in 1976, which is quite early in, in, the, in the stages of academic feminism. Um, and it was founded in Würzburg in, in, in Germany. It was created to, to address that feeling of wrong that was felt uh, around the fact that, that in the universities, at the philosophy departments, women were a very small minority uh, among the professionals. There has been some change since that, but uh, it still seems to remain the fact that uh, Philosophy departments are in the world, all over the world are predominantly male. Um, the initial idea was to, to provide mutual support uh, for the minority of uh, women philosophers and to promote feminist philosopher as, philosophy as well. Uh, currently, IAPH works uh, as, a, as a network, as a, as a network that provides a forum for discussion, uh, forum for interaction and cooperation among women engaged in teaching and research uh, of philosophy and feminist thought. Uh, the main activity of this association are conf congresses, conferences, international conferences like this one we are now attending. Uh, thus far there has been 14 of these conferences. Uh, in the 1980s they were held in Germany. Um, then in the 1990s also Netherlands and Vienna and in 19, the 1998 uh, conference was in Boston, US. Uh, and then since that, in the 19, oh, 2000s, there's been uh, organized, um, the conferences have been organized almost regularly in two years uh, uh, periods. And, and there have been many memorable conferences. There was the Bar Barcelona conference 2002, uh, Göteborg in Sweden 2004, Rome 2006, uh, and Seoul, Korea, 2008. The last conference was held in London, Canada, 2010. Um, in addition to these conferences, IAPH, IAPH runs a website uh, where members can post uh, their publications, their work, and, and add, so ads to publishing their books, as well as events. And we strongly encourage you as members to, to make use of this website. So basically, anybody interested in promoting the cause of women in philosophy is welcome to join the association uh, as a member, IAPH. The number of members at the moment is, is not huge. It's around uh, 400. Uh, but the members come from 35 different countries. Uh, and you are all warmly welcome to join the uh, General Assembly meeting, which will be held uh, during this conference uh, on Friday at 11.30. Uh, the IAPH has developed from a small organization of, of predominantly German women, uh, or people from German-speaking countries, in connection with some American women, uh, to an organization of international range. The Seoul Conference was remarkable uh, in that it drew for the first time really a lot of philosophers, women philosophers from Asian and African countries, uh, which was a real, a real uh, delight for, for uh, everybody. And this globalization will go on. The next IAPH symposium in two years, in 2016, will be held in Melbourne, Australia. In the world of um, the professional associations within philosophy, IAPH is a member of the International Federation of Philosophical Societies, FISP. Uh, and we have also always organized program within FISP, uh, FISP which organizes these large congresses of philosophy, including the last year's one in Athens. 
the next World Congress in Philosophy will, be, will take place in 2018 in Beijing, China. And IAPH intends to be present with program of panels and, and society meeting there as well. So IAPH does not have member, organiza member organizations itself. There are several uh, countries uh, where there are national organizations of women philosophers. Uh, and, but the relations, we have relations uh, between these organizations, uh, but the relations of IAPH to these organizations is of mutual interaction and cooperation, but not hierarchical. IAPH remains a small organization with low membership fees on purpose, with a small budget. The board members are working on voluntary basis, including all the speaker and secretary and treasurer and the webmaster. Board members pay their trips themselves to, to meetings and conferences. There's always, there has always been within IAPH this feeling that, that something is created out of nothing, or almost nothing, <laughs> or rather that, that something, something big intellectually exciting is achieved by just devoted interest in philosophy and feminism. And over many, many years, uh, many philosophy-oriented women have contributed to IAPH in, in this way. And I take here an opportunity to thank all those who have contributed to uh, over years in various way, ways. I'm sure that there are many of you here in, in, in this room at the moment and in this uh, symposium. The symposia has, have always been organized with, through individual initiative and with local effort. And the board is always looking for new suggestions for future locations and responsible actors for organizing symposia. As to this 15th symposium, we are extremely happy to be here in Alcala, the University of Alcala. And the reason for why we are here in Alcala is sitting here on this, at this table, uh, who's Professor Stella Villarmea. And I would like to express on behalf of the present board uh, and entire <clears throat> organization, our warmest gratitude to you, Stella, for, for, for taking the initiative and, and carrying through this, this, the organizations. We are fully aware what it takes, what kind of effort it takes to, to, to be resp responsible of an event of this size. We thank you profoundly for your initiative and for your energy. Thank you. Stella will tell more about the conference. Professor, Professor, Doctor Don Fernando Galván, Rector Magnífico de la Universidad de Alcalá, Distinguida Profesora Doctora Maxim. Elliot Professor, Doctora Judith Butler, Distinguida Profesora Doctora Tuya Pulkinen, Representante de la Junta Directiva de la Asociación Internacional de Filósofas, Distinguida Profesora Doctora Cristina Crespo, Representante del Instituto Franklin, Distinguidas Vocales y estáis sentadas por distintos sitios de la Junta Directiva de la IAPH, IAPH, Distinguidas integrantes de los comités organizador, científico y asesor del Congreso. Distinguidas socias y socios de la IAPH. Distinguidas profesoras, profesores, asistentes. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you as general coordinator of the conference to the 15th International Association of Women Philosophers Symposium entitled Philosophy, Knowledge, and Feminist Practices, which will be taking place from June 24th, 27th, at the Universidad de Alcalá. Meine Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen, es ist mir eine große Freude und außerordentliche Ehre, Sie hier heute an der Universität Alcalá 
zu dem 15. Symposium der Internationalen Gesellschaft der Philosophinnen begrüßen zu dürfen. Les doy la bienvenida más cordial como coordinadora general al 15 simposio, ya lo saben a estas alturas, de la Asociación Internacional de Filósofas con el título Filosofía, Conocimiento y Prácticas Feministas. La práctica filosófica desde la teoría feminista ha aportado al conocimiento otras miradas y enfoques, tan novedosos como sugerentes. El objetivo de este simposio es evaluar el impacto que las teorías y prácticas feministas tienen en el pensamiento y la filosofía contemporáneas. La filosofía se preocupa por entender nuestra realidad en todos sus aspectos. La existencia de una comunidad de filósofas es una buena manera de contribuir a la construcción de un mejor mundo futuro. Philosophers share a dedication to the life of the mind and strive to understand our world in all different aspects. The symposium provides a unique opportunity to women philosophers and friends of philosophy and feminism from all corners of the world to meet to contribute their ideas, to, to exchange points of view, to argue and to present the fruits of their research to a unique and distinguished academic audience. The meeting seeks to help foment a real sense of a world philosophical community. The very existence of a community of women philosophers gives hope to the promise of a more enlightened world in the future. The members of the organization have worked hard to offer participants and guests a very academic program with two plenary lectures and over 250 speakers from 33 countries, Germany, Mexico, South Korea, Chile, 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 Ireland, the Philippines, United Kingdom, Morocco, Taiwan, France, Finland, Brazil, Italy, Denmark, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Ukraine, Portugal, USA, Austria, Colombia, the Netherlands, Argentina, Argentina, Poland, Canada, Greece, Russia, Croatia, Turkey, Hungary, South Africa, Australia, Palestine, and Spain, and the different countries in Spain. To complement the nine parallel sessions, roundtables, and workshops, we will have a series of artistic and cultural activities that will keep us all very busy for four days. Over the next days, we will discuss current issues relating to the pressing gender issues and contributions of women and the position of women in philosophy to exchange ideas, as they say today, to network. In the long years of common struggle, since the founding year 1976, for the visibility of women philosophers in the scientific area and for the development of our scientific approaches, perspectives and issues, we have done a lot and achieved a lot. In our society, there is an increasing awareness of the strengths of women, of the importance of the strengths of women, of the importance of equal opportunities and the confrontation of inhumane treatment. We must be present in all discussion of philosophical questions so that our approaches and theories be heard and become influential and effective. We need to work together against the narrow, narrowing of public and private possibilities for freedom of speech, movement, and thought. For this reason, we have set a variety of panels on these matters. You will find outstanding philosophy, knowledge, and feminist practices by our members who think about the increase of gender equality and integration of women in all areas of society. Dear colleagues, it has filled me during the preparations with great joy to register the multiple initiatives of all you lectures. This symposium is on the one hand an accounting and on the other hand a further sensitization to capture the old and new structures of injustice. The topics must be pointed at by us persistently. In the first place, I think of direct and indirect violence against women and their underlying traditions, attributions, exclusion, and barriers which contribute to this violence. Furthermore, I think of gender differences as an excuse, excuse for economic segregation that gender differences expose, and of the almost exchange role of women in the care sector. But overall and underneath, there is still a man's power of definition in our society in which we as women philosophers can make a breakthrough. <laughs>
I wish to thank the, the institutions that have supported us financially in spite of the budget cuts. The International Association of Women Philosophers, La Universidad de Alcalá, La Consejería de Cultura del Ayuntamiento de Alcalá, La Sociedad de Filosofía de Castilla-La Mancha, El Instituto de Filosofía del Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas, CSIC, El Vicerrectorado de Igualdad y Cooperación y la Unidad de Igualdad de la Universidad Carlos III de Madrid y la Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia, UNED. I, was, I want to thank the IAPH board, and you are all seated some, somewhere, for trusting our proposal, our proposal also, to bring the 15th IAPH symposium to Alcalá. I thank the organizing committee um, for their philosophical experience, motivation, patience, and support. Let me mention their names. Rocío Orsi, Sonia Reverter, Ángeles Jiménez Perona, Concha Roldán, Carmen González Marín y Julio Seane. Two of the members are not here today, two of the organizing committee, at least. I know they wish they could be here and we are grateful for their contribution. Thanks also to all the members of the scientific committees, the consultant committee, and the chairs of each panel for their help and work. My special thanks to Instituto Franklin, UAH, and its wonderful personnel, in particular, Cristina Crespo and Isabel Albella. They have worked hard and professionally to make this encounter a fruitful and pleasant experience for all of us. Great job. Huge thanks to you volunteers who probably are outside, helping people outside, but thank you for your generosity, drive, and collaboration. I want to thank our plenary speakers, Judith Butler and Amelia Valcarcel, for kindly accepting our invitation to be here with us. And last but not least, my warmest thanks to all the speakers and attendees. It is you who make this gathering possible. You demonstrate the importance of the existence of our organization and help increase our influence. I wish you all a very happy and successful symposium with many interesting and fruitful encounters and contribute that contribute to both personal and philosophical self-awareness. Ich freue mich auf den Austausch mit Ihnen allen und danke Ihnen allen für Ihr Kommen. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos al 15 Simposio de la Asociación Internacional de Filósofas Alcalá 2014. Well, before, before making the formal declaration of opening this conference, which is what corresponds at this moment, let me thank Stella particularly for her work, for her effort, uh, for her commitment with philosophy as well as with the University of Alcala. So Stella, thanks very much. And let me also um, express my gratitude to Cristina, to Cristina Crespo, and to the whole Franklin Institute. I've seen many young people outside working and helping for the organization of the conference. So uh, thank Cristina and Julio uh, for your cooperation in the organization of this conference. And of course, uh, to you, thank you for your words, and thank all of you for coming to Alcala. So now the conference is open. Enjoy it.
Just a few announcements before introducing Professor Butler. Um, everyone who wants to follow her lecture is welcome to plug into the website. The conference is posted on the symposium uh, website. There is an English version and a Spanish translation that Professor Butler has generously provided. Also, uh, if you wish, you can follow the, during the conference uh, on your electronic devices, as I said, but uh, just be aware for us to know that there are more people outside of this building in another room, and the conference will be followed there by streaming. Two simple questions. The program has changed on and on, so that the, always the latest program is in the web, on the website. And the abstracts for you to read are on the website as well. So that's it for announcements. And now, um, ¿Se necesita que lo diga en español lo que acabo de, de decir? Simplemente todo se puede seguir a través de aparatos. Eh, la conferencia de la profesora Butler en inglés o en español está disponible en la, en la web. So, welcome, Professor Butler. Judith Butler is Maxine Elliott Professor in the Departments of Rhetoric and Comparative Literature and the Co-Director of the program of critical theory at the University of California, Berkeley, at Berkeley. She received her PhD in philosophy from Yale University in 1984 on the French reception of Hegel. Judith Butler is the author of different books. I will read some of them. Subjects of Desire, Hegelian Reflections in 20th Century France, Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion, Subversion of Identity, Bodies That Matter on the Discursive Limits of Sex, The Psychic Life of Power, Theories of Subjection, Excitable Speech, Antigone's Claim, Kinship Between Life and Death, Precarious Life, Powers of Violence and Mourning, Undoing Gender, Who Sings the Nation State, Language, politics, belonging, with Spivak. Frames of War, When is Life Grievable? And two recent co-authored co volumes, is Critique Secular and The Power of Religion in Public Life. The last was published in 2011. She's also active in gender and sexual politics and human rights, anti-war politics, and Jewish Voice for Peace. She is presently the recipient of the Andrew Mellon Award for Distinguished Academic Achievement in the Humanities. It is a particular honor to receive Professor Butler here with us today to give her plenary lecture on rethinking vulnerability and resistance. As some of you may know, and the rector has told us just a moment ago, University of Alcalá conferred a doctor degree to Maria Isidra Quintina de Guzman, making her the second woman in the world to possess this degree. Even before this, Francisca de Nebri has served as professor of rhetoric around 1520. We could consider her a predecessor of many of us here today. Ich bin stolz, dass in diesem Jahr 2014 die Universität Alcalá Professor Butlers Vortrag ausrichten durfte. Damit kann an unserer Universität die Präsenz von Frauen in der Wissenschaft bekräftigt und gefördert werden. In diesem Zusammenhang danke ich vor allem an Judith Butler. Estoy muy feliz de recibir a la profesora Judith Butler en la Universidad de Alcalá y en nuestro simposio. Y le agradezco muchísimo que aceptara nuestra invitación. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias.
Um, gracias, me siento muy honrado de estar hoy aquí. Me gustaría dar las gracias a todos los que trabajaron uh, tan duro en este congreso, este evento. Tal vez un día voy a dar una conferencia en español y espero. Um, ich habe keine Einführung auf Deutsch, aber ich konnte das spontan machen. Ähm, ähm, äh, if we think about recent forms of political assembly, they do not always take place on the street or in the square. Sometimes that is because Streets and squares do not exist or do not form the symbolic center for a specific political community and its aspirations. For instance, a movement may be galvanized for the very purpose of establishing adequate infrastructure or keeping adequate infrastructure from being destroyed. We can think about mobilizations in the continuing shanty towns or townships of South Africa, Kenya, Pakistan, the temporary shelters constructed along the borders of Europe, but also the barrios of Venezuela, the favelas of Brazil, or the barracas of Portugal. Such spaces are populated by groups of people, including immigrants, squatters, and or Roma, who are struggling precisely for clean running water, working toilets, sometimes a closed door on public toilets, paved streets, paid work, and necessary provisions. So the street is not always the site that we can take for granted as the public ground for certain kinds of public assemblies. The street as public space and thoroughfare is also a public good for which people fight, an infrastructural necessity that forms one of the demands of certain forms of popular mobilization. You understand me so far? I'm intelligible? Good. You tell them, I went to listen to Judith Butler and I understood every word. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, just having a good time in Alcala. Okay. <laughs> so the street is not just the basis or the platform for a political demand, but an infrastructural good. And so when assemblies gather in public spaces in order to fight against the decimation of infrastructural goods, to fight against austerity measures, for instance, that would undercut public education, libraries, transit systems, and roads, we find that the very platform for such a politics is one of the items on the political agenda. Sometimes a mobilization happens precisely in order to create or keep the platform for political expression itself. The material conditions for speech and assembly are part of what we are speaking and assembling about. We have to assume the infrastructural goods for which we are fighting, but if the infrastructural conditions for politics are themselves decimated, so too are the assemblies that depend upon them. At such a point, the condition of the political is one of the goods for which political assembly takes place. This might be the double meaning of the infrastructural under conditions in which public goods are increasingly dismantled by privatization, neoliberalism, accelerating forms of economic inequality, and anti-democratic tactics of authoritarian rule. I begin then by calling attention to the infrastructural conditions of mobilization 
as well as the preserving of infrastructural goods as an aim of mobilization, but not because I will give an account today of infrastructure. I hope to do that another time. I do this here because I would like to rethink the status of embodiment and vulnerability within political mobilizations. In effect, the demand for infrastructure is a demand for a certain kind of inhabitable ground, and its meaning and force derives precisely from uh, the lack of such a ground, when there is a lack of such a ground. The street cannot be taken for granted as the space of appearance, to use Hannah Arendt's phrase, the space of politics, since there is, as we know, a struggle to establish that very ground. And Arendt is at least partially right when she claims that the space of appearance comes into, into being at the moment of political action. But this is also, I would suggest, a romantic notion of an embodied performative speech act, to be sure, since in any time or place that we act, the space of appearance for the political comes into being. Of course, that is not always true. We can try to act collectively, and no space of appearance is established. And that usually has to do with the absence of media or particular ways that the public sphere is structured to keep such actions from appearing. Arendt clearly presumes that the material conditions for gathering are separate from any particular space of appearance. But if politics is oriented toward the making and preserving of material conditions, or what I'm calling the infrastructural, then it seems that the space of appearance is never fully separable from questions of infrastructure, infrastructure or indeed from questions of architecture. What implications does this notion of supported political action have for thinking about vulnerability and resistance? Well, there are two concepts that form the focus of this lecture, and my task is to suggest a new way of understanding that interrelationship. In a sense, we already know the idea that freedom can only be exercised if there is enough support for the exercise of freedom, a material condition that enters into the act and makes it possible. Indeed, when we think about the embodied subject who exercises speech or moves through public space across borders, it is usually presumed to be one that is already free to move and to speak. Either that subject is endowed with that freedom as an inherent power, or that subject is presumed to live in a public space where open and supported movement is possible. The very term mobilization depends on an operative sense of mobility, itself a right, one which many people cannot take for granted. So for the body to move, it must usually have a surface of some kind. It must have at its disposal whatever technical supports allow for movement to take place and the pavement and the street are already to be understood as requirements of the body as it exercises its rights of mobility. No one moves without a supportive environment. No one moves without a set of technologies. We could certainly make a list of how this idea of a body, both supported and agentic, is at work implicitly or explicitly in any number of political movements. Struggles for food and shelter, protection from injury and destruction, the right to work, affordable health care, protection from police violence and imprisonment, from war or illness, mobilizations against austerity and precarity, authoritarianism and inequality. So on one level, on one level, we are asking, 
about the implicit idea of the body at work in certain kinds of political demands and mobilizations. On another level, we are trying to find out how mobilizations presuppose a body that requires support. In many of the public assemblies that draw people who understand themselves to be now in precarious positions, the demand to end precarity is enacted publicly by those who expose their vulnerability to failing infrastructural conditions. There is plural and performative bodily resistance at work that shows how bodies are being acted on <clears throat> by social and economic policies that are decimating livelihoods. But these bodies, in showing this precarity, are also resisting these very powers. Um, oh, okay, gracias. Sí, sí. Oh, perfect, okay. these bodies in showing their precarity, in demonstrating their precarity, are also resisting these very powers. They enact a form of resistance that presupposes vulnerability of a very specific kind and opposes precarity. What is the conception of the body here and how do we understand this form of resistance? If we make the matter individual, we can say that every single body has a certain right to food and shelter. And although we universalize in such a statement, everybody has this right, we also particularize understanding the body as discrete, as an individual matter. And that individual body is itself a norm of what the body is and how it ought to be conceptualized. Of course, that seems quite obviously right, but consider that this idea of the individual bodily subject of rights might fail to capture the sense of vulnerability, exposure, even dependency that is implied by the right itself and which corresponds, I would suggest, with an alternative view of the body. In other words, if we accept that part of what a body is, and this is for the moment an ontological claim, part of what a body is, is its dependency on other bodies and networks of support, then we are suggesting that it's not altogether right to conceive of individual bodies as completely distinct from one another or from the environments upon which they depend. Of course, neither are these bodies all blended into some amorphous social body, but if we cannot readily conceptualize the political meaning of the human body without understanding those relations in which it lives and thrives, I think we fail to make the best possible case for the various political ends we seek to achieve. So what I am suggesting is that it is not just that this or that body is bound up in a network of relations, but that the body, despite its clear boundaries, or perhaps precisely by virtue of those boundaries, is defined by the relations that makes its own life and action possible. As I will hope to show, we cannot understand bodily vulnerability outside of this concept of relationality. One clear dimension of our vulner vulnerability has to do with our exposure to name calling and discursive categories, uh, those that arrive for us in infancy and childhood and continue to uh, arrive for us throughout life. All of us are called names and this kind of name calling demonstrates an important dimension of the speech act. <clears throat> We do not only act through the speech act, speech acts also act upon us. There's a distinct performative effect of having been named as this gender or another gender, as part of one nationality or a minority, or to find out that how you are regarded in any of these respects is summed up by a name that you yourself did not know prior to being called that name. 
We can and do ask, am I that name? How do we think about the force and effect of those names we are called before emerging into language as speaking beings, prior to any capacity for a speech act of our own? Does speech act upon us prior to our speaking? And if it did not act upon us, could we speak at all? Perhaps it's not simply a matter of sequence. We can ask the question this way. Does speech continue to act upon us at the very moment in which we speak so that we may well think we are acting, but we are also acted upon at the very same time? Several years ago, Eve Sedgwick and I spent some time thinking about the relationship between performance and performativity. Sedgwick found that speech acts deviated from their aims, very often producing consequences that were altogether unintended and oftentimes quite felicitous. For instance, she argued one could make a marriage vow and this act could actually open up a zone of possible sexuality that takes place quite separately from marriage understood as the publicly known and accepted institution that apparently organizes sexuality in conjugal forms. Sedgwick underscored the sense of how a speech act could veer away from its apparent aims, and this deviation was one sense of the word queer, understood less as an identity than as a movement of thought and language contrary to accepted forms of authority, opening up spaces for desire that would not always be openly recognized. In my earlier work, I was interested in how several discourses on gender seem to create and circulate certain ideals of gender, generating those ideals, but taking them to be natural essences or internal truths that were subsequently expressed in those ideals. So the effect of a discourse, in this case, a set of gender ideals was broadly misconstrued as the internal cause of one's desire and behavior, a core reality that was expressed in one's gestures and actions. That internal cause or core reality not only substituted for the social norm, but effectively masked and facilitated the operation of that norm. The formulation that gender is performative became the basis for many long discussions on topics, including two quite contrary interpretations. The first was that we radically choose our genders. The second was that we are utterly determined by gender norms. Those wildly divergent responses meant that something had not quite been articulated and grasped about the dual dimensions of any account of performativity. And as I explain this, I ask you to keep in mind that we are moving towards an understanding of bodily vulnerability and resistance, and I want to suggest to you that these are parallel issues, okay? If language acts upon us before we act, and if language continues acting in every instance in which we act, then we have to think about gender performativity first as, say, gender assignment, all those ways in which we are, as it were, called a name, entered into a discourse, a gender, prior to any under understanding of how gender norms act upon and shape us, prior to our own capacity to reproduce those norms in ways that we might choose. Choice, in fact, comes late in this process of performativity. And then secondly, following Sedgwick, we have to understand how deviations from these norms can and do take place, suggesting that something queer is at work at the heart of gender performativity, a queerness that is not so very different from the swerves taken by iterability in Derrida's account of the Speech Act as citational. So let's assume then that performativity describes both the processes of being acted upon and the conditions and possibilities for acting, and that we cannot understand its operation without both of these dimensions, that norms act upon us implies we are susceptible to their action, 
We are vulnerable to their action. We are indeed vulnerable to a certain name calling from the start. And this registers at a level that is prior to any possibility of volition or choice. An understanding of gender assignment has to take up this field of an unwilled receptivity, susceptibility, and vulnerability, a way of being exposed to language and power prior to any possibility of forming or enacting a speech act. Norms such as these both require and institute certain forms of corporeal vulnerability without which their operation would not be thinkable. That is why we can and do describe the powerful cit citational force of gender norms as they are instituted and applied by medical, legal, and psychiatric institutions um, as having an effect on our embodied experience. We object to the effect they have on the formation and understanding of gender in pathological or criminal terms, and we register that pathologization and that criminalization at a corporeal level. This very domain of susceptibility, this condition of being affected, is also where something queer can happen where the norm is refused or revised and where new formulations of gender begin. Although gender norms precede us and act upon us, that is one sense of their enactment, we are obligated to reproduce them and that is the second sense of their enactment. Precisely because something inadvertent and unexpected can happen <clears throat> in this realm of being affected we find forms of gender that break with mechanical patterns of repetition, deviating from, resignifying, and sometimes quite emphatically breaking those citational chains of gender normativity, making room for new forms of gendered life. All right, so when a transgendered person objects to a gender assignment, we see precisely that break with the first sense of gender enactment. The theory of gender performativity, as I understand it, never prescribed which gender performances were right uh, or more subversive, which were wrong and which ones were reactionary. That was never the point. The point was precisely to relax the coercive hold of norms on gendered life, which is not the same as transcending all norms for the purposes of living a more livable life. So gender performativity does not just characterize what we do, but how discourse and institutional power affect us, constraining and moving us in relation to what we come to call our own action. To understand that the names we are called are just um, um, as important to performativity as the names we call ourselves, we have to identify the conventions that operate in a broad array of gender assigning strategies. Then we can see how the speech act affects and animates us in an embodied way. Indeed, the field of susceptibility and affect is already a matter of a corporeal registration of some kind. Indeed, the embodiment implied by both gender and performance is one that is dependent on institutional structures and broader social worlds. We cannot talk about a body without knowing what supports that body, what its relationship is to that support or lack of support might be. In this way, the body is less an entity than a relation, and it cannot be fully dissociated from the infrastructural and environmental conditions of its living. In this way as well, the dependency on human and other creatures, on infrastructural support, exposes a specific vulnerability that we have when we are unsupported, when those infrastructural conditions start to decompose, or when we find ourselves radically unsupported in conditions of precarity. Both performance studies and disability studies have offered the crucial insight that all action requires support. <clears throat> 
we find forms of gender. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, sorry. Um, even the most punctual and seemingly spontaneous act implicitly depends upon an infrastructural condition that quite literally supports the acting body. The idea of support is quite important, not only for the re-theorization of the acting body, but for the broader politics of mobility, what architectural supports have to be in place for each of us to exercise a certain freedom of movement, one that is necessary in order to exercise the right to public assembly. In the same way that we claim that the Speech Act depends upon its social conditions and conventions, we can also say the performance of gender more generally depends upon its infrastructural and social conditions of support. This bears implications for a general account of embodied and social action, but also for understanding the bodily risks that women take walking on certain streets at night, assembling in public squares, the sexual assaults in Tahrir Square would be an example, and, and the risks that transgendered people take in walking on the street or gathering in public assemblies or even trying to go into a bar or to their place of employment in several countries in this world. Of course, all public assembly is haunted by the police and the prison. And every public square is defined in part by the population that could not possibly arrive there. Either they are detained at the border or have no freedom of movement and assembly, or they are detained or imprisoned. In other words, the freedom to gather as a people is always haunted by the imprisonment of those who exercised that freedom and were taken to prison. So when one arrives in public or common spaces with radical and critical views, there is always an anxious or certain anticipation that imprisonment may follow. Sometimes we walk or run knowingly in the direction of prison because it is the only way to expose illegitimate constraints on public assembly and political expression. This was, of course, Gandhi's point, that sometimes we know we're going to prison, right? But we do go precisely in order to make the point that we should be able to assemble without going to prison. In Geze Park, some who were assembled were detained, others were hurt, the lawyers who came to help, those who were detained were themselves detained, and sometimes the medical workers who, ca who, who came to help the injured were themselves injured. And so a new group would arrive, mm, members of, um, of uh, the press, health professionals, lawyers replenishing the network of support. With Pussy Riot, demonstrations broke out in major cities all across the globe, and internet forms of solidarity emerged to put pressure on governments and human rights agencies to press for the release of those imprisoned and to object to the conditions of political imprisonment more generally. Both of these examples compel us to turn our attention to political imprisonment and to the institution of the prison industry as a global mechanism for the regulation of citizenship. In the United States, two-thirds of prisoners are black men, and nearly every person on death row is a person of color. Angela Davis has argued that the prison in the United States continues the work of slavery by suspending the very rights of citizenship for people of color. It becomes slavery by another means. At the same time, though, prisoner solidarity networks are among the most important grassroots movements operating now in places like Turkey, Chile, Argentina, Serbia, Serbia and Palestine. Women are at the forefront of these struggles. Feminism, I want to suggest, is a crucial part of these networks of solidarity and resistance precisely because feminist critique destabilizes those institutions that depend on the reproduction of inequality and injustice. And it criticizes those institutions and practices that inflict violence on women and gender minorities, and in fact all minorities subject to police power for showing up and speaking out as they do. We are now witnessing mass movements against the idea of gender in France, 
uh, in several Eastern European countries, such as Poland and Slovakia. And these are allied with movements against reproductive freedom, gay marriage, against lifting constraints imposed upon women's literacy, employment, and expressive freedoms. Time and again, we hear from government authorities in several parts of the world that equality and freedom go against the common norms of their national culture. Okay, that's quite a thing to say. Equality and freedom go against the common norms of a national culture, or that equality, freedom, and injustice are unrealistic, or that equality and freedom are dangerous, posing grave security risks to the nation or to Europe, or indeed, sometimes, to civilization, or, as Putin would say, the soul of man, the soul of man. Um, <clears throat> few struggles are, in fact, Pussy Riot was accused of attacking the soul of man, maybe. Few struggles are more important than those that call into question so-called common norms by asking whose lives were never included in those norms. Whose lives are, in fact, explicitly excluded from those norms? What norm of the human constrains those common norms? And to what extent are those masculinist norms? Can we perhaps mobilize all the expression of the senses, including sound and image, to lay claim to a free and livable life and to a sensate democracy over and against such claims. I've been suggesting that we rethink the relationship between the human body and infrastructure so that we might call into question the body as discrete, singular, and self-sufficient. And I have proposed instead to understand embodiment as both performative and relational. Relationality includes dependency on infrastructural conditions and legacies of discourse and institutional power that precede and condition our existence. I'm also suggesting that certain ideals of independence are masculinist and that a feminist account exposes the disavowed dependency at the heart of the masculinist idea of the body as self-sufficient. This is different from saying that women's bodies are something or another, or what men's bodies are. I'm not making those claims. Some of you are free to make those claims, and I will listen carefully. But I'm only showing what I take to be a masculinist conception of bodily action that should be actively criticized. My reference to dependency may well include the dependency on the mother or of a caretaker who could be a man or a woman or another gender, but that is not the primary form of dependency that concerns me here. By theorizing the human body as a certain kind of dependency on infrastructure, understood complexly as environment, social relations, and networks of support and sustenance, the human proves not to be divided from the animal or from the technical world. Indeed, we must foreground the ways in which we are vulnerable to decimated or disappearing infrastructures, economic supports, and predictable and well-compensated labor. We are then not only vulnerable to one another, which is an invariable feature of social relations, but our vulnerability indicates a broader condition of dependency and interdependency, which changes the dominant under un ontological understanding of the embodied subject. So um, there are many reasons. So one, one point I am making here is that human vulnerability, if understood as a vulnerability to technical support, to environment, to other living processes, actually has uh, compels us to rethink what we mean by the human and to contest its um, self-sufficiency or its ontological separateness from these other categories. Now, there are, of course, many reasons to be opposed to vulnerability. Um, um, and, I, and I want to argue um, uh, against the idea um, that vulnerability is the opposite of resistance. Indeed, I want to argue affirmatively that vulnerability, understood as a deliberate exposure to power, is part of the very meaning of political resistance as an embodied enactment. 
I know that speaking about vulnerability produces resistance of various kinds, and not just the kind of political resistance that I hope to show requires vulnerability as part of its very enactment. There are those who worry that vulnerability, if it becomes a theme or a problem for thinking, will be asserted as a primary existential condition, ontological and constitutive, and that this sort of foundationalism or existentialism will founder on the same rocky shores as have others, such as the ethics of care or maternal thinking. Does a turn to vulnerability seek to reintroduce those particular modalities of thinking and valuing back into public discourse? Is it smuggling in discounted paradigms for reconsideration? The resistance to vulnerability sometimes is formulated on political grounds. After all, if women or minorities seek to establish themselves as vulnerable, do they unwittingly or wittingly seek to establish a protected status subject to a paternalistic set of powers that must safeguard the vulnerable, those presumed to be weak and in need of protection. Does the discourse of vulnerability discount the political agency of the subjugated? So one political problem that emerges from any such discussion is whether the discourse on vulnerability shores up paternalistic power relegating the condition of vulnerability to those who suffer discrimination, exploitation, or violence? What about the power of those who are oppressed? And what about the vulnerability of paternalistic institutions themselves? After all, if such institutions can be contested, brought down, or rebuilt on egalitarian grounds, then paternalism itself is vulnerable to a dismantling that could potentially undo its power. When this dismantling is undertaken by subjugated peoples, do they not establish themselves as something other than or more than vulnerable? Indeed, do we want to say uh, that the subjugated overcome their vulnerability when they enter into effective resistance? Um, this would be to assume that vulnerability is negated when it is converted into agency. Or do we want to say that vulnerability is still there in such acts of resistance, but now uh, assumes a different form? Of course, there are justified political objections to the fact that dominant groups can use the discourse of vulnerability to shore up their own privilege. In California, when white people were losing their status as a majority, which they have now lost, some of them claimed that they were a vulnerable population, that white people are, are vulnerable. Um, colonial states have lamented their vulnerability to attack by those they colonize and sought general sympathy on the basis of that claim. Some men have complained that feminism have, have made, has made them into a vulnerable population and that they are now targeted for discrimination. Various European national identities now claim to be under attack by new and established migrant communities. We can, seem, we can see that the term has a way of shifting, and since we may not like some or even many of the shifts it makes, we may find ourselves somewhat awkwardly opposed to the idea of vulnerability. Of course, that's a very funny thing to say, since we might conjecture that any amount of opposition to vulnerability does not exactly defeat its operation in our bodily and social lives. That seems to be a minimal truth that we can accept, say, from psychoanalysis, or indeed from the account of social construction that I've offered. And yet, do our political objections to vulnerability make us into psychoanalytic fools and do our psychoanalytic affirmations of vulnerability make us complicit with political positions we do not condone? When we oppose vulnerability as a political term, it's usually because we would like to see ourselves as agentic, or we think that better political consequences will follow if we see ourselves that way. If we oppose vulnerability in the name of agency, or indeed resistance, does that imply that we prefer to see ourselves as those who are only acting but never acted upon? How might we then describe those 
regions of both aesthetics and ethics that presume that our receptivity is bound up with our responsiveness, a zone in which we are acted upon by what we find at the same time that we act upon it in certain ways. Does the opposition to vulnerability also imperil a host of related terms like responsiveness, impressionability, susceptibility, injurability, openness, indignation, outrage, and even resistance? If nothing acts on me against my will or without my advanced knowledge, then there is only sovereignty, the posture of control over the property that I have and that I am, a seemingly sturdy and self-centered form of the thinking I that seeks to cloak those fault lines in the self that cannot be overcome. What form of politics is supported by this adamant mode of disavowal? As I've tried to suggest by calling attention to the dual dimension of performativity, we are invariably acted upon and acting, and this is one reason why performativity cannot be reduced to the idea of free individual performance. We are called names and we find ourselves living in a world of categories and descriptions way before we start to sort them critically and endeavor to change or make them on our own. In this way, we are quite, in spite of ourselves, vulnerable to, affected by discourses that we never chose. And in a parallel way, I want to suggest that there is a dual relationship to resistance that helps us understand what we mean by vulnerability. On the one hand, there's a resistance to vulnerability that takes both psychic and political dimensions. The psychic resistance to vulnerability wishes that I I uh, uh, was such a creature that discourse and power are never imposed upon me in a way that I have not chosen. And, and this resistance serves a notion of individual sovereignty um, and rejects the shaping force of history on our embodied lives. On the other hand, the very meaning of vulnerability changes when it becomes understood as part of the very practice of resistance. Indeed, one of the important features of public assembly that we've recently um, um, sought to confirm is that political resistance relies fundamentally on the mobilization of vulnerability that plural or collective forms of resistance are structured very differently from the idea of a political subject that establishes its agency by vanquishing its vulnerability. And I take this latter to be a masculinist ideal. But regardless of the psychological resistance to vulnerability, there are leg legitimately political criticisms of some of its appropriations. There are those who argue that vulnerability cannot be the basis for group identification without strengthening paternalistic power. Once groups are marked as vulnerable within human rights discourse or legal regimes, those groups become reified as definitionally vulnerable, fixed in a political position of powerlessness and lack of agency. All the power belongs to the state and those international institutions that are not now supposed to offer protection and advocacy for the vulnerable. Such moves tend to underestimate or even actively efface modes of political agency and resistance that emerge within so-called vulnerable populations. To understand those extrajudicial modes of resistance, we would have to think about how resistance and vulnerability work together, something that the paternalistic model cannot do. The second major objection, political objection, is that there are too many cynical and self-interested appropriations of vulnerability by dominant groups, and I have uh, suggested um, how some of those work. Um, um, <clears throat> in those instances, it is uh, the privilege of the dominant which has become vulnerable to being undone by increasing demands for equality and freedom. That um, um, cynical use of vulnerability effaces the condition of vulnerability in which precarious populations live, and it constitutes an ideological seizure of the term to expand and rationalize inequalities. 
In my view, vulnerability ought not to be affirmed simply as an existential condition, although yes, we are all subject to accidents, illness, and attacks that can expunge our lives quite quickly. Even so, it would not be a sufficient politics to embrace vulnerability or simply to get in touch with our feelings or bear our fault lines as if that might launch a new mode of authenticity or inaugurate a new order of moral values or a sudden and widespread outbreak of care. Um, I'm not in favor of such moves toward authenticity as a way of doing politics, for it continues to locate vulnerability as the opposite of agency and to identify agency with sovereign models of defensiveness, and to fail to recognize the ways in which vulnerability can be an incipient and enduring moment of resistance. Once we understand the way vulnerability enters into agency, then our understanding of both terms can change, and the binary opposition between them can become undone. I consider the undoing of this binary framework a feminist task. To summarize then, vulnerability is not a subjective disposition, but a relation to a field of objects, forces, passions that impinge upon or affect us in some way. As a way of being related to what is not me and not fully masterable, vulnerability is a kind of relationship that belongs to that ambiguous region in which receptivity and responsiveness are not clearly separable from one another and not distinguished even as separate moments in a sequence. Of course, I'm aware that I've used resistance in at least two ways. First, as the resistance to vulnerability that characterizes that form of thinking that models itself on mastery. Second, as a social and political form that is informed by vulnerability and so not one of its opposites. I've suggested that vulnerability is neither fully passive nor fully active, but operating in a middle region, a constituent feature of a human animal both affected and acting. I'm thus led to think about those practices of deliberate exposure to police or military violence in which bodies put on the line either receive blows or seek to stop violence by presenting themselves as living blockades or barriers. In such practices of non-violent resistance, we can come to understand bodily vulnerability as something that is actually marshaled or mobilized for the purposes of resistance. Of course, such a claim is controversial since these practices can seem allied with self-destruction. But what interests me are those forms of nonviolent resistance that mobilize vulnerability for the purposes of asserting existence, claiming the right to public space, equality, opposing police violence, security measures uh, uh, that involve police violence and military actions. We may think that these are isolated moments in which a group decides in advance to produce a blockade or to link arms in order to lay claim to public space or to resist being removed by the police. And that is surely true, as it was in Berkeley in 2011, when a group of students and colleagues were assaulted by police forces on campus at the very moment they were practicing a nonviolent protest. But consider as well that for transgendered people in many places in the world, and for women who seek to walk the street at night in safety, the moment of actively appearing on the street involves a deliberate risk of exposure to force. As we know, this is certainly true of groups who gather without permits and without weapons to oppose privatization and rally for democracy, as we saw in Gezi Park in Istanbul last June, but also as we saw in the Puerta del Sol. Although such groups are shorn of legal and political protection, they are not for that reason reduced to some sort of bare life. There's no sovereign power jettisoning the subject outside the domain of the political as such. Rather, there is a renewal of popular sovereignty outside of and against the terms of state sovereignty and police power, one that involves a concerted and corporeal form of exposure and resistance. So vulnerability can emerge within resistance movements and indeed direct democracy movements precisely as a deliberate mobilization of bodily exposure. I suggested earlier we had to deal with two senses of resistance here, 
resistance to vulnerability that belongs to certain projects of thought and certain formations of politics organized by sovereign mastery, and a resistance to unjust and violent regimes that mobilizes vulnerability as part of its own exercise of power. I've now tried to suggest that the body is exposed both to police force and, um, and of course, in public assemblies, to photographic capture, and that on certain occasions, um, photographic journalism still has the power to exploit and reverse visual icons of sexualized violence, and I've talked about this elsewhere. The scene of vulnerability is one in which there's always a force field to which any creature is exposed, and that includes both humans and their animal counterparts. It's not simply a subjective feature of the human, nor is it precisely an existential condition. Rather, it names a set of relations between sensate beings and the force field of objects, organizations, life processes, infrastructural institutions that constitute the very possibility of livable life. These relations invariably involve degrees and modalities of receptivity and responsiveness that working together do not precisely form a sequence. In political life, it surely seems that some injustice happens and then there is a response. But it may be that the response is happening as the injustice occurs, and this gives us another way to think about historical events, action, passion, and forms of, of resistance. It would seem that without being able to think about vulnerability, we cannot really think about resistance, and that by thinking about resistance, we are already underway, dismantling the resistance to vulnerability in order precisely to resist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bartler. Gracias. Va a moderar la sesión eh, la profesora Pulkinen. Okay. We opened the door. Uh, door. We opened the door. That's what's interesting. We opened the floor. <laughs> For, and, maybe, and maybe we... we is there anyone from the organization to for the air conditioning, I think, mm. to... Yes, yes, we would like to have... <laughs> Hi, I go. It's fine? Is it fine? I just... Okay, we open the floor for discussion. So you are welcome to ask questions. You are welcome there. Okay, um, the very brief answer to that. Um, it is true that um, philosophers like Hegel, especially Hegel, have been criticized for um, giving us the idea of a master subject, one who is fully self-sufficient um, and who seeks to appropriate and um, um, dominate all forms of difference. But I do think that um, in reading the phenomenology of spirit, you can see um, that time and again there is a kind of submitting to difference or submitting to what is outside. Um, uh, and that this idea of, of submitting and being changed by, by um, this kind of receptivity is part of, of Hegel's um, 
idea of development uh, in the phenomenology, and I think it's generally um, not uh, not appreciated. Uh, uh, so I think there is a, a way of reading Hegel against the idea of of the of the notion of the of of self sufficient sovereignty or uh, the master subject. Um, but that would be another lecture. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. You're welcome to come to the front to use the micro because we don't have other micros. So anyone who wants to yes. raise a question, please. Uh -huh. or use this. Yes. I can slip out through here, actually. Yes. <coughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, gave us so much to think about. Um, in your discussion of the cynical abuse of the language of vulnerability, I thought I detected a translation of a discussion about victimhood into the language of vulnerability. So that I'm, I'm thinking, um, for example, of Martha Minow's work mm -hmm. on the discourse of victimhood mm -hmm. and uh, the problem that the claim that I am a victim uh, quickly turns into, you know, I'm a victim too mm -hmm. on the part of the those who are being accused of mm -hmm. victimizing. And so, I'm vulnerable. Uh, no, I, the white Californian, <laughs> am vulnerable oh. to that sort of thing. Um, so I, I wondered, um, given that there is that close relationship uh, in, in the uses of the language, um, whether you want to explicitly disavow talk of victimhood, which has also, of course, been associated with passivity, helplessness, non-agency. Um, I mean, I think that's a completely mistaken understanding of victimhood myself, but uh, it, it is associated that way. Um, you want to, is it your intention to get rid of that language, or are you willing to acknowledge the importance of allowing that one consequence of our vulnerability is that we can become victims mm -hmm. of various kinds of aggression mm -hmm. and cruelty, mm -hmm. abuse. Uh, is there room for that still in your thinking? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to s translate everything into talk of vulnerability and its relation to agency? Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, this is, of course, an excellent question. I'm aware that, that you and other people have been working on um, these topics uh, um, very productively. Um, I, think, I think that it's not a question of substituting one vocabulary for another. Um, I, of course, there are people who continue to say, um, to deny victimization, right? Um, so we think about um, um, genocidal uh, deaths that are denied by revisionists. We think about um, uh, those who've been tortured or disappeared and they've been denied by public authorities or by courts, right? So. Um, in these cases and in many others, in cases of, um, of, of rape, um, um, uh, victimization has to be asserted. Okay. So let's think about this phrase, victimization has to be asserted. Um, victimization has to be asserted, um, and those who deny victimization have to be uh, refuted, but in asserting victimization, 
we have to ask what kind of agency that is. And if we enter into a legal regime in order to make a case, uh, and we get defined as victims, there is an open question about whether we can make use of the law that defines us as victims in order to overcome our victimization. That is to say, in order to act, in order to expose the injustice, in order to establish historical crimes as such, um, can we work effectively within a discourse that keeps us from being, that keeps us defined as victims um, if we are so deeply defined as victims that we cannot act effectively, then we are re-victimized. But if we can use some of those legal or political uh, or media-driven frameworks in order to effectively assert what, what has happened, um, then it seems to me that we are, we are actually exercising political agency at the same time that we are affirming or acknowledging a victimization and that those two things are not contradictory, right? But if the terms by which I assert my victimization keep me a victim, then I cannot assert it. <laughs> In other words, what's the status of my assertion? At a certain level, I'm discounting my own assertion because I'm not a creature who can assert in that way. So there has to be both, um, there has to be a deliberate political form of agency that those of us who have been victimized um, uh, make use of for ourselves. And sometimes people have found it's better not to work with the law. And in other, time, other times people have found that the law has to be changed in order to provide for greater effective action. So there's always that critical question that we have to pose. Now, my view is that vulnerability and agency can work together in the, effect, the effective opposition to victimization and the effective assertion that victimization has happened. Right? That's not a contradiction. It can become a contradiction under certain political conditions. And, and that's what also has to be resisted. Right? That's the only answer I have for that at this point. Hmm. OK, thank you. Next question is here. Actually, that answers in large part my question um, following up on, on Diana's. I'm Kim Layton from the U.S. Um, there's a nice slippage in your talk between mobility and mobilization. Yes. So mobility seems to be in some ways a, a property of the subject, where mobilization captures much of the relationality that you're talking about, but even more so, it, it, it captures or, or tracks the conditions of appearance or appearancing in some sense. And so I guess I wondered in, if you could elaborate a bit on what you think of as sort of the normative, the, the, in a sense of ethical, the, the normative conditions of mobilization, which I think is part of what you're trying to say in answer to the previous question. What, what's what's the, maybe the opposite of the mobilization of vulnerability? What's the immobilization? When is it that the vulnerable in its articulation ends up somehow becoming immobilized or Im immobilizing, right? What does it shut down? And I kept thinking about sort of the old debate about pornography and the use of the law and what it is to shut down the possibilities of reiteration and, and mm -hmm. interpretation and how, how dangerous it is in some sense to use the law as a means of protection. Um, so, so is there a way to elaborate what the conditions of mobilization for mobility are? Um, that you could that you could speak to. Yes. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm realizing that those who have English as a first language are more comfortable asking questions. <laughs> but I would take questions in um, in several languages, so don't uh, hesitate. Um, First of all, I don't think mobility is simply um, a feature of an individual or a particular subject. I think what mobility is, is a, it's a relationship to infrastructural possibilities um, and to space um, and to um, 
um, to space and time both, actually, um, that, um, that has been brought to the fore um, both by disability studies in one way and by the importance of the right to public assembly in another way. And those are, in fact, actually connected. But I think um, um, to, you know, um, uh, many people who are part of disability studies or part of the disability movement have, um, have pointed out that being able to move at all requires architectural space that is organized in such a way that mobility is supported and facilitated. Um, those who are uh, taking to the streets or the, to the non-streets um, in South Africa or indeed um, in, in Brazil as we speak are objecting to the fact that um, huge amounts of government money are being put into other kinds of operations rather than the building of roads or um, uh, the building of, of proper infrastructure that would allow people to get to work or allow people to move or allow people to assemble. Um, when, um, when assemblies are banned from um, Geze Park or assemblies are banned from uh, Tiananmen Square, um, we're also, we also see a kind of restriction on mobility that is enforced um, in those cases by uh, government and police action. So I think one could work with the idea of um, the free freedom of mobility uh, as a normative idea, something that is important uh, for human creatures more generally and that ought to be realized and that social um, and political um, uh, um, efforts ought to be made to secure uh, mobiliz mobilization um, for people who are restricted um, uh, for any number of reasons, economic, social, political. And I think that there are links there. So um, mobility, there is a mobilization for mobility in, in disability studies for sure, and I think they are linked. Um, I don't know if it's a slippage, maybe it's an actual uh, moment of solidarity. Um, but I, I think um, uh, if, if we start from the idea that freedom of assembly uh, requires the ability of four people to gather, we can move back from there to like, how do they get there? <laughs> Will they be imprisoned on the way? Who can get there, who cannot? Who's already in prison and cannot get there? Um, who's living on the, outside the metropole? How does that work for those who are mobilized on the margins of the metropole? I think all of those issues are raised and, and they are normative in the sense of um, uh, uh, ethical, I think, in the way that you, that you suggest. Okay, thank you. Next question is up there. And we have three questions now in the line, including this one, so there's still some space. You can also, it would be probably nice to introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robin Schott um, from uh, uh, Copenhagen. And thank you so much for your remarks today. Oh, and uh, I have been very interested in the shift from your language of grievability oh. to vulnerability. So mostly, uh, if you could speak to how you understand that shift. Uh, is it the case that vulnerability is uh, broader than the concept of grievability as it recognizes a greater number of uh, uh, harms that are fundamental in violating living a life? Um, or in terms of understanding the, uh, the scope of relationality, or in terms of understanding the nature of materiality. Here you use the uh, terms about infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you, Robin. Um, uh, well, I think that, um, I mean, I'm continuing to uh, work with the notion of grievability, but Perhaps I could uh, very briefly suggest the way in which it's connected to um, my thinking about vulnerability. Um, um, uh, I, I've made the argument before um, that um, 
we can see in certain situations and situations of war, but also I think global economic situations where certain populations are um, understood um, as, um, as un ungrievable, that is to say, uh, their loss through targeted destruction or through sy systemic negligence um, is not remarkable. They're, the loss of such populations is not grievable. It's, they're not valuable lives that, who will be actively mourned um, uh, by those who are operating within um, dominant structures of power. Um, and in that sense, they're already disposable or, or ungrievable uh, prior to being um, destroyed or prior to, um, prior to dying uh, through, um, through deprivation or, or systemic negligence of some kind. Um, um, and of course, that leads to the question, well, what would it be like to try to establish conditions of livability on, on the basis of equality. In other words, what would it be like to live in a world in which all lives are equally grievable? Um, and uh, this, um, for me, that's, that's a, an, a normative ideal. Uh, um, all lives should be treated as equally grievable, um, uh, as having equal value. But for lives to be treated as grievable, it means that Lives have to be supported. They have to be given, they have to be provided for, they have to have access to um, infrastructural conditions that allow a life to be livable. Um, and I understand many of the mobilizations that are currently happening um, against precarity and against austerity as making an explicit claim um, that, um, that such lives that are subject to displacement, dispossession, unemployment, um, uh, disease, or death um, uh, uh, ought to be supported and ought to be able to um, 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 uh, presume and work for conditions of, of livability. So um, in a way, um, the question of what is it that might safeguard a life from becoming disposable? <laughs> what is it that might safeguard a life from becoming uh, a non-life? Or uh, how would it, what, what would need to happen um, for lives to uh, more equitably um, be regarded and treated as grievable and as valuable? Um, and so for those lives to be um, supported and safeguarded. And, th and it's at that point that we have to ask, well, what is it that we require? What is it that a life requires in order to be livable? And, and I, I think one of the things we're seeing is that precarity um, is precisely the condition of being deprived of the basic um, elements that are needed for a livable life. Um, and if we say that, then um, um, we, we have an idea of the body at work, <laughs> a, a body that is dependent, a body that requires infrastructure, a body that is vulnerable to, infra to infrastructural uh, deprivations, that is vulnerable to unemployment, that is vulnerable to war, that can be taken away. Um, so I suppose it's just another way of approaching this question of how, uh, how we understand the, the, the normative claims of the precarious. And I think we can't do that without understanding the various ways in which um, bodily vulnerability uh, implies a broader social world and a broader social world of support. Hi, I'm Jen McQueenie from okay, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And um, my question is, I was wondering if you could say more about where this impulse for resistance comes from or where vulnerability comes from on your performative account. Because I'm thinking of um, Beauvoir's, Simone de Beauvoir's claim in The Second Sex, where she says every child has 
a spontaneous tendency to regard their body as subject. Um, and so I'm wondering, and so for her, vulnerability comes from when this spontaneous tendency to regard yourself as subject gets distorted and you take a different attitude to your body. And so vulnerability is not just about bodily exposure, it's actually about a particular attitude. It's about um, an attitude that you take to your body that changes the structure of your consciousness. Mm. And so it sounds like you want to do something that gives more variation than that and more relationality than that. And I'm wondering how your account, performative account, would compare to that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, um, I'm, I'm very indebted to Beauvoir, and I always love um, teaching and, and reading her, but I must say, um, that I think her, um, I think that I can't accept the idea that there is a, a basic spontaneous um, uh, s um, uh, self-regard on the part of the infant um, as a subject. I mean, at what point, you know, one would ask in the, um, in the formation of a life, do, does that become a possibility? I think as soon as we pose the question of subject formation, which is very different. It's not a question she poses. Um, she thinks that the structure of the subject is there, and it's just a, a question of it being allowed to spontaneously express its own proper structure. And for me, um, the idea of the subject is, is formed, and, um, and it's formed within um, um, uh, discourses and institutions of, of, of various kinds. Um, and, and I was using the example of gender assignment, for instance, to suggest uh, that um, we are very often uh, um, uh, gendered way before we are able to take a certain kind of point of view on, on, on what those gender categories are. So, um, uh, and yet, it seems to me that you know, if we just like take the example of gender, and I know that there are many examples here, but let's say, let's say somebody develops a resistance to the way in which they've been gendered. You know, they may want to stay within a certain gender category. They may want to shift it all together, or they want to make, you know, major modifications. But the resistance to being gendered in certain ways is very, very interesting, and it can emerge quite early on in life. Um, it can also be suppressed really early on in life, um, but. I, don't, I, I guess I'm more of a Foucauldian in this regard and would suggest uh, uh, that that operation of power on us is, is also the very possibility of resistance and that we don't have to look outside of, of that to see that. Um, um, when we do, um, but, but I also want to say in a way that I don't think Foucault really um, can take account of is that those kinds of categories act on us in corporeal ways and tend to, they, they try to shape us. I mean, I don't think they're totally effective in shaping us, which is why there is resistance, right? Or they, they could produce like all kinds of complications, right? It's acting on me, but I'm acting against it or I'm acting with it in the wrong way, right? Uh, uh, there are many kind of deviations that happen at that, that point of contact. and. Um, and I think there are corporeal forms of resistance, like I'm not wearing that dress, or I am wearing that dress, or I you know, refuse to walk that way, or I can't talk that way, or I, you know, I mean, just at very basic um, bodily levels, there are ways of accommodating and resisting gender norms among children that I think um, would be really interesting to look at in this way. But I, don't, but I think we're vul we are vulnerable. To say that we're formed by all kinds of conventions and institutions that act on us prior to our emergence into what Beauvoir would call consciousness means that we are, we're vulnerable to that which we never chose. And, and she might say, yes, that's what we call our situation or some kind of facticity. Uh, but I want to say, if we're going to give an account of how we're acted on and how that continues to act upon us as we act, I think we need an account of vulnerability that would not just be um, an ex post facto attitudinal contribution to the scene. Okay, thank you. I'm mind um, of the of the, of the I, fact that it seems to 
be native English speakers who are speaking, so I encourage people who are not the native English speakers <laughs> to ask questions and you can also also even try, you can be imaginative, like, like try mixtures of languages or something, and I'm sure there are interpreters if there's something that's if it's difficult, yeah. But I have people, and, and, and the system is to just put out your hand and, 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 and I'll, I will see, because we, we have three we people. We end soon though, right? and, and we are uh, ending as... No, no, no I'm, just, I'm not requesting, I'm just was yeah, well, concerned we, we've about got this. Time. We've country. got time otherwise, okay. but you can indicate whenever you okay. feel like you are, right. have, have had enough of... Well, we'll wait till I get a really bad question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so so let's say that now this is the last chance, chance, and and not, uh, and and we have uh, now three questions here, okay. and then, uh, then the, that's that's the fourth, and yes, and then we need, and we'll take several questions in a row now, yes, okay. so that uh, to get a little bit. Uh -huh. Okay, so the next one is now here first. They, um, in the order of what they have been asked, I have them all. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I, you're shaking your head no, Stella. Um, I, Naomi Shiman from, from the U.S. I'm, I'm afraid another native English speaker. I could try mixing some languages, but I wouldn't, okay. do, very, I wouldn't do a very good job of it. Um, and, and I hope this doesn't count as a bad question. Um, <laughs> It's uh, asking you to say something about um, some very difficult issues that I know you have thought and acted and written a great deal about, um, and that has uh, how issues specifically of vulnerability enter into issues of Israel and Palestine. And the particular way that I'd like you to, to speak to this is the, the obvious way that um, discourse of vulnerability and of course victimization has um, underwritten the Zionist project um, in obvious ways and been given as the uh, justification for all kinds of things that the State of Israel has done. And that there's been a response to that that I think is, on the one hand, quite justified, on the other hand, I want to suggest perhaps problematic, and that is to deny vulnerability, um, either the vulnerability of the State of Israel or vulnerability of Jews globally, um, and the questions of what happens when one brings up continuing problems with anti-Semitism and so on. And the, the Zionist project, as, as I see it, has largely been one of trying to do away with Jewish vulnerability, of trying to create conditions of invulnerability as the only way to deal with that. And a response to that has been, I think, to say that Jewish vulnerability or Israeli vulnerability is no longer the case that Israel is enormously powerful and essentially invulnerable, and there's a great deal of truth to that. But what I wanna ask you to speak to specifically are the possibilities in the name of global justice and justice for the Palestinians of holding on to notions of even distinctive Jewish vulnerability, but reading them, enacting them, requiring them to be enacted in a morally responsible way. So what are the morally appropriate ways of thinking about distinctive Jewish vulnerability? Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And, yes. Yo voy a hablar en, en castellano porque no me sale mucho el inglés. Que me pongo aquí, ¿no? Nada. Bueno, que muchas gracias por la conferencia. Eh, eh, me imagino que como otras personas de aquí, yo he pasado por, por, por la lectura suya y por otras lecturas, eh, digamos, del movimiento de la teoría queer. Y en estos momentos eh, eh, he llegado como a autoras afro, Bell Hobbes, eh, Adru Lorde, y me he sentido muy hipócrita al leerlas y al hablar de la cuestión de privilegios y, y como que he entendido como de alguna manera como 
como que yo no estaba dispuesta a renunciar a algunos privilegios que tenía por haber nacido donde había nacido y vivir donde, donde vivía. Sí, es una pregunta breve. Ah, sí, cuestión muy breve. Bueno, pero era para introducirla porque si no queda un poco rara la pregunta. Pero bueno, allá va. Eh, lo que yo quería preguntarle es que llegó un momento en como que he perdido un poquito el objetivo de cuál era mi lucha. Eh, la he perdido de alguna manera. No tengo claro ahora mismo qué era lo que yo reclamaba o por qué yo me metí a leer todo esto. Y he, he sentido en lo que usted dice la importancia del cuerpo y eh, eh, ahora pues, he empezado a trabajar y a leer en torno al pornoterrorismo. Y quería consultarla si usted conoce la teoría y si ha practicado algo y, y cómo lo ve en ese sentido. Entiendo un poco. Pero, una, una traducción por sí, nosotros. Stella will summarize. Well, um, you, 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 I think you have said that you've lost mm, the, the idea of what you were fighting for, or you, you are kind of in the middle, or in these situations where you don't know anymore what was for, what was it about. And then uh, you were asking about the subject of porn of terrorism and whether you know about it and you've okay. said whether the you've practiced it. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, oh. But that say was, uh, sorry, no, no, not making any jokes. Say, yes. just, just say, say the term again. again. The practice of what? Porn oh, yeah. terrorism. terrorism. Oh, okay, great question. But what we, what we need to do is to summarize to good, um, some, pe some people and close. Do you understand that, John? <laughs> Muy bien. <laughs> Just those two? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, these two now. Okay. Um, okay. Um. <laughs> Do, dos preguntas, tres diferentes. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, um, I think that there are, are many different issues um, that Naomi's question raises, and, on the, and, and I guess I would want to distinguish um, between um, um, the victimization of the Jews in the Nazi genocide, um, continuing anti-Semitism, and what forms that takes. Um, and I would want to say that um, both, there, there has to be absolute unambiguous acknowledgement of both forms of anti-Semitism. In fact, I think we have several forms of anti-Semitism, which um, I think made, was made clear in the attack on, on the Jewish Museum in, in Brussels, right? Uh, it could have been the Flemish. It, it happened to be uh, um, a, a Syrian uh, French resident. Um, uh, it, it was plausible. It could have been one form or another of anti-Semitism, right? And these are not the same. Um, so we, we have active forms of anti-Semitism um, that uh, ought not to be denied. And if um, the critique of Israel entails a kind of revisionism that denies anti-Semitism, then it needs to be revised, okay? It's, it's not compatible. Um, but, um, so there's a distinctive history of anti-Semitism that needs to be understood. Um, and then there are, of course, um, there's, there's another problem or another kind of argument, which is that the Jews, um, have been so badly victimized, how could anyone understand them as doing anything other than acting in self-defense? In other words, because anti-Semitism continues to be so great or because it has to be understood as continuous with former genocidal forms, self-defense is not only necessary but justified. Um, and it's at that point that one has to ask whether um, 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 anti-Semitism 
always takes the same forms, and whether um, a political resistance to Zionism is necessarily a form of anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, um, it's on that last topic that people get very confused and uh, concerned. Um, what is a legitimate anti-colonial struggle on the part of the Palestinian people? What, um, what are a set of actions or practices that are fueled by anti-Semitism? Is it an opposition to the state of Israel or is it an opposition to Jews more generally? And of course, it's very hard to disarticulate those two things um, when attacks on Israel are, for the most part, attacks on Jews, although let's remember that at least 20% of the Israeli population is Palestinian and not Jewish. Um, so um, there, I mean, I, th I feel like this relates to the earlier point I tried to make about victimization. In a way, um, victimization in the past and even in the present has to be affirmed, but it cannot be used to establish a group of people as permanently victimized, such that their own actions or their own destructive actions are rationalized by virtue of that victimized st status. But those are two different things. And you know, there's a wonderful um, Israeli historian, um, Edith Zertal, who has written about this, on why um, opposition to anti-Semitism and the commemoration of um, uh, the Jews who were killed in, 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 the, in the Nazi Holocaust has to be an absolute ethical uh, obligation and that it must be kept separate from any kind of political rationale for how the Israeli state now acts. It doesn't mean that the Israeli state is wrong to say that there's no contemporary anti-Semitism. I'm, I'm not saying there, there is contemporary anti-Semitism. Okay, let's not be foolish and let's not deny that. I think that would be a terrible error. Um, there's no question in my mind. Um, uh, but how do we distinguish anti-Semitism from a political struggle on the part of the Palestinian people to achieve the end of, of, a, of colonial rule? Okay. Now, some of that responsibility is with Palestine to try to articulate what its goals are in such a way that it can um, very clearly distinguish between anti-Semitism and anti-colonialism. And some of it, unfortunately, is part of the media <laughs> representation of these views. But in my own work, I've tried to think about what cohabitation looks like um, and what mutual dependency looks like. Um, and I think that that involves um, a recognition of mutual vulnerability. Um, now, there might be some distinctively Jewish vulnerabilities, there might be some distinctively Palestinian vulnerabilities, and, and there are, and we can elaborate on those, but whatever these distinctive vulnerabilities are that belong to a particular people, they have to be in some ways understood as not, not exclusive properties, in other words, um, I may have a distinctively Jewish vulnerability, but that doesn't mean that I have a Jewish monopoly on vulnerability. <laughs> and there may be distinctive Palestinian vulnerability, but there's no Palestinian monopoly on vulnerability. In other words, vulnerability can allow us to move toward an idea of interdependency, which quite frankly, I think is the only way to think about the political future of Israel-Palestine. So at what point does a identity-based notion of vulnerability move into an idea of interdependency. And interdependency, by the way, is not love, uh, right? Interdependency is not love. Like, um, I, I can, and, and, and this is, I, I very much like Hannah Arendt on this, right? Doesn't mean, uh, when, you, when you agree to acknowledge the right of another to live on this world with you, it doesn't mean you love them. It doesn't mean you're going to marry them. It doesn't mean that this is some fabulous moment of love from St. Francis of Assisi or wherever, Paul, you know, whatever people are doing with that right now. I may agree heart, I don't follow the love thing very well. Um, 
right? It, it could be very ambivalent. I'm attached, I'm dependent, I, I'm angry, I, I hold uh, enormous uh, antagonism, grief, rage, but in the middle of my grief, in the middle of my rage, I honor your capacity to exist with me in this world interdependently and on a condition of equality. Now, when I have said that in public before, I've been accused of terrorism, going to the second. But you know, I do not believe that's a terrorist position. I think it's a radical democratic position. It could have a one-state solution. It could be a two-state solution. Maybe states are not so great anyway. Uh, you know, whatever. I just think that's a kind of ethical desideratum, right? No matter what my specific history of vulnerability is or my people, it cannot keep me from the recognition of a reciprocal interdependency. Um, and that is what I, I believe that is the ethos towards which everyone must be, be struggling. Um, so I don't know about porno terrorism so much. Um, I guess I'd like to learn about it. And I'm sorry that I'm not uh, so helpful there. But I think that um, there are a lot of very queer notions of affiliation and public action that we find now in the contemporary mobilizations against precarity and austerity. I think at this point in time, it's important to think about modes of solidarity and mobil mobilizing together that actually um, uh, make, make a difference for those whose um, uh, capacity to, um, um, to live a livable life is imperiled. I, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done in um, opening up sexual spaces and in combating forms of sexual repression that are, um, that are unjust and, um, and, and violent. Uh, and sometimes um, we need radical art forms and radical media strategies to do that. Um, there's no question about it. Um, I think perhaps uh, if there's a um, well, one of the weaknesses of my remarks today is that I wasn't able to talk more about the media and media strategies in relationship to public mobilizations, but I think it's really crucial. So thinking about strong and radical media, media interventions is, is, is crucial to what I'm um, thinking about in terms of political mobilizations and, um, and democratization struggles. Anyway, thank you for your patience. Yes. Gracias. Thank, thank you.